Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and in this video we're going to be doing an overview and thoughts on the live letter. What live letter was this? It says right there, 57. My goodness, for some reason I thought it was 52. I guess I just forgot the V. Uh, this was the part two live letter leading into patch 5.2. So a bunch of additional details, some gameplay footage was shown, uh, and a little bit of a scolding from uh, Yoshi P, who uh, took on a dad role for the first 30 minutes or so of the live letter. It started off immediately with the trailer after a couple of test streams, and I will be, I actually will have already posted a, an initial reaction to this live. And I'll be going over the English one and watching that and trying to analyze it in another video later today. So we're not going to talk too much about that in this. But my first viewing, I was just like, I don't even know what's going on. It's just it's crazy. It's too much going on. I'm, I'm, I'm losing my mind. Okay. That's the only reaction I could think to have. So it started with Yoshi P talking about how he's going to be, a, you know, one of the pre-made characters in Neo 2. I've seen, we've seen Yoshi P characters in a bunch of games, Monster Hunter, Neo. I remember seeing him in Neo 1, actually, so I wonder if that's what got him into that uh, voting contest for Neo 2. Uh, there's the English trailer. Oh, by the way, uh, we are using the unofficial translations from Reddit for this. These are not official translations. Granix does provide those a little bit later on, and they usually have a bit more clarification. They do, like, some live on the forum, some from um, an official digest that comes a bit later. But uh, keep in mind that these are all unofficial, provided by Miyuna over on the Reddit Discord, and Shinitan doing the pictures with a little bit of support from Eluna Minori as well. So, uh, they confirmed the patch is going to be February 18th. We've been predicting that for ages now, so it's really not surprised. Yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about with Neo 1 and making characters. Sorry, my Twitch chat's calling me out on that. I'm thinking of a different game. Something around them that wasn't Monster Hunter that I remember him see seeing him in. Regardless, anyway, uh, other trailers. They watched it again with a little bit of additional commentary, so there's a few more screenshots here. Um, but then Yoshi P went into scold mode regarding um, lewd mods and third-party applications, most specifically ACT. Um, so <laughs> it started with him saying, please don't use lewd mods or take lewd screenshots. It's not allowed, and in some countries it may even be against the law. So uh, don't do it, is all he had to say. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, certainly... Um certainly a, an interesting discussion to have started on and then he went into talking about third-party tools specifically making some similar statements to things he's made in the past for people who may be newer to final fantasy 14 since shadowbringers essentially the the gray area with those items is still very much a gray area i'm looking forward to the official translation for this to see because i'm sure there's some much uh tighter wording in that than this unofficial translation which is kind of confusing and, and leaves a little bit to be desired on the topic. Basically, the terms of service are the same. Third-party applications like ACT and a bunch of the other things that are out there are not allowed. Um, things like Discord or live streaming on Twitch, those things are fine, but things that adjust the actual gameplay are still very much, as they always have been, against the terms of service. Now, that being said, they still say here, um, you know, we're not going to penalize you for having, like, a parser over the screen. For example, you know, but he, you know, Yoshi P says he's an engineer. He knows you can technically acquire things like make an Excel macro to read a log file after after a fight is done, you know. But he just keeps saying, you know, please don't use these. Uh, you know, it's there's there's just all sorts of like really vague comments about it right here. Um, you know, someone gets called out for low DPS. The problem isn't really a third party tool. It's harassment of course that in my opinion depends on the context of how you tell the person like it's always really awkward when you try to tell someone hey you know uh, we we're trying to win the fight and you just it's not quite up to par you know is there any way we can improve this versus hey shithead go die in a fire you fucking asshole noob guy there's yeah there's some pretty some pretty big dynamics with that one um but this is just it's very generalized it just says calling somebody out for low dps as could be harassment so it's it's just a very general statement made here but this is we can't do anything in some cases like if people have a little window showing act they're not gonna skid in of course it would be against the law for them to do something like scan your computer 
Um, but then he started talking about additional plugins that ACT uses that is really what's kind of prompting this. It's not really the DPS meters outside of the potential harassment that's the biggest concern. It's stuff like tools that instantly replace uh, markers on the ground, which was very prominent in the Epic of Alexander. Uh, you see it in almost all kill videos nowadays that that is like a very normal thing that somebody is using. And uh, Yoshi, they, they went so far because of that, they're making changes to markers in 5.2, so you can no longer do that. Which I think is just going to prompt an arms race of modders to then try and find other third-party ways to do it. Like, it's it's the reality of the situation. This is going to keep escalating. I can only see that coming in the future of this kind of war between the developers and the people who want to do modding work. It's just, it's it's an unavoidable result if, the, if this keeps going down this exact same path. Um... So on top of that, they even said there's clips showing a tool where it shows you where an un an unmarked AOE where it will hit. I've I've seen that around a bunch of discords and Reddit, and they say that if they see you're using them, they will punish you for things like this. So uh, they're going to start cracking down on the types of third party tools they see, which we did have a banning situation a few months back that was tied to um, uh, harassment. At least that's you know what. You know, we kind of judge from it because things got all out of hand from them using Twitch VODs to make the ruling on the in-game player, which is something they've never done before. And uh, this will probably, that'll probably continue to be a trend with this thing. So if you ever use these, especially if you live stream or you create video content, expect to get hit with a ban hammer so if they can tie it back to you. It's very, very likely to happen in the future. So please keep that in mind. Um, but then... This part, I get kind of 50-50 on how I feel. So they, they talked about that. That I'm fine with their stance on it. I don't want those kind of third-party tools. And I'm already not a big fan of triggers to begin with. But that being said, this next part kind of bothers me. So they're changing the way markers work in 5.2. They're giving us eight markers in total, but you can no longer change markers in combat. Um, they're also adding presets for markers. You can save up to five presets total, and they're saved on a per fight basis. Like you can save, like the first slot could be like your preset for an EX trial, and your second one could be for you know the raid, like one of the raid fights or something like that. And it's easy to quick and update. It's a great feature to have in the game. It's definitely a time saver um, for the average player who wasn't using the tool that was mentioned with Alexander earlier. Um, but there's like there's a lot of cases where the ability to change markers in combat outside of this tool that's now abused it was something that was commonly used and was manually done. Um, turn 9 and even the unending coil of Bahamut placing dive bomb markers based on where the... Uh, the dive bombs were going to, you know, where they were going to be coming from, where the dragons were placed. Um, people did that manually for the most part. And that was, you know, now that's been done away with. People will either have to, like, call out, like, 1 o'clock, 4 o'clock, like, clock positions or uh, find another way of communicating it to market. And so, uh, you know, for situations like that where it was being done completely legitimately, it's super unfortunate this is a thing. And I'm very curious to see what the solution ends up being for going back and re-clearing some of these old fights. Um, because now you just can't change markers in combat and you can't change presets in combat They made sure to clarify on that that presets are strictly before combat starts uh, So that's that's I yeah, we'll see how people get around that uh, It's one of those things that you know, it's uh, you know, it's kind of ruined for some of us. So um, It is what it is though, and we'll just have to adjust going forward. It's nice to have the extra markers though I'll say that much I mean eight markers total I, I honestly, they could give us the whole alphabet, and I'm sure some people would find a way to make a light show out of it, and it would all make sense. So there's that coming. Uh, and then that was like the first 40 minutes of the like three to three and a half hour live letter. Um, and then they went into reminding us of some of the stuff that's coming, and then they started diving into a lot of the new stuff. Um, they said that the cutscenes for 5.2 story are uh, quite a bit longer, so if you plan on sitting down to do it, you know, make make some free time because you're gonna need it pretty much you might want to not plan to do other content that day i'd assume it'd take probably three to four hours usually when they say stuff like that maybe a bit longer but uh you know have some free time available um we also have the other new content that's coming we have the sorrow of war lit side series quest that's going to be the one that has the 
uh, weapon encounters from Final Fantasy VII. Ruby Weapon being the first encounter we're getting uh, on this patch. Also, we have our new quest series for upgradable equipment, our Relic series, and they gave us a lot of information about this a little bit later. It's going to be called Save the Queen Blades of Gunhilder. For those who don't know, it was teased that we would be dealing with the area uh, in Bajja. Bajja, which was the location of the Bajja Citadel, which... Uh, was famously the spot where Sid lost his dad to the Meteor Project way back when. Um, that's going to be the area around that is Hrothgar Homeland. And so they want it back. And then we're going to be talking about that a little bit more, but that's kind of the base of the information we've been given. The upgradable equipment will be in 5.25. This is fairly normal to do this in 0.x5 patches. And again, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Now, something interesting. So Cinder Drift and Cinder Drift Extreme. Those are Ruby Weapon and Ruby Weapon Extreme. Also, the Anamnesis Anitor is part of the Instance Dungeon. They said it would be in, like, a little bit later into the story than dungeons have been for the given patches. But then they had this secret trial. Now, we've all been speculating. Is this a new main scenario trial? Is this a new, you know, is this Hildebrand? Surprise, surprise. It's coming in 5.25. And according to some of the later information, it's tied to the Relic quest line. Now, there's some other comments regarding that secret trial that we'll get to in a little bit as well. Because I'm excited. Because we lost the dungeon this patch, so everyone's paying very close attention to see what other content comes with this new dungeon change. And there's a lot of promises of things in this live letter that are either to come soon or in later patches. Now, specifically... They say it's about extreme difficulty, but they're not going to call it an extreme. So we technically get two extreme patches, or two extreme boss fights in this patch, one of them being tied to the Relic Quest. So I am excited for that, because that takes me back to the Realm Reborn era Relics, where things were just way simpler. It was a series of quests, you completed them, some menial objectives, a few revisiting old trials, you know, some really simple, basic, but at least required a, at least a little bit more involved gameplay out of the player. Um, and I enjoyed that. I do enjoy having a lot of options, though, and it seems like that kind of option-based uh, progression will be more in the later patches and less for this initial patch, where they're kind of trying to replicate the initial obtaining of the relic like a Realm Reborn, and then later make it so that's when we have this like whole upgrade process that goes in all these sorts of different directions. Um, this is a dungeon boss from Anamnesis Anitor. These are from the 5.2 promotional site, which I have been told has some additional content on it that we'll probably make a video for a little bit later. Eden's Verse and Eden's Verse Savage, they come out the same day. Now this is normal for point two and point four patches. If it's not normal for expansion launches, so they do those two week gaps. This is normal. We get normal and savage on the same day. They seem to be kind of, maybe we'll change it in the future. They said they contemplated changing it for 5.2, but they decided to keep it the same. So we may not see that being the same way for forever at this point. Um, there's going to be some PvE and PvP adjustments uh, for jobs. They mentioned a little bit later, but Red Mage is going to get buffed. Summoner is going to take some dot potency nerfs. Uh, Samurai is going to get their meditation stacks added to their job UI. And then there's going to be a few PvP adjustments on top of that. Some PvP adjustments to Dancer, PvP adjustments to Warrior. Uh, but they said there won't be very many job changes in this patch. Uh, and that we probably will see it when the server goes live, pretty much. Ishgard Restoration, bunch of new stuff. They went over this in the first part of the live letter and expanded on it a little bit later in this one. Yeah, here's where they say they'll do job adjustments later. Um, Ishgard Restoration content will be in 5.21, which is three weeks after 5.2, which is unusual because it's normally two weeks after 5.2. Really trying to shake up the formula on this one. A few statements, you know, reiterating some stuff from before. So the new expert difficulty recipes, because they're a lot more on your feet crafting it's you can't macro it because it's they've added a whole bunch of you need to adjust to this situation kind of uh, uh situations you need to deal with didn't want to say situation twice so because it's much different and a good bit more difficult they're actually adding training recipes so you can use like some low uh you know some some cheaper items to practice this kind of system before you throw your expensive items at them and you know risk losing them in the in the actual, uh, you know, crafting of the items you're looking for. And the rankings for Ishgard will begin 10 days after release of 5.21. Or, I'm sorry, they will only start calculating in 5.21 and every 10 days after that. 
Um, there's also some other updates, you know, we're getting more changes to Disciples of Hand and Land, some updates to Fishing, the Sky Steel tools, which are like Crafter Relics, this seem really simple. Mater materia system changes, things like Spirit Bond, uh, no longer losing the item when you uh, create material off a Spirit Bonded item, as well as only needing one Crafter to 80 to meld everything. Um, and Ocean Fishing, which they went into a good bit of detail a little bit later. So, uh, yes, yeah, so update some crafting action, some will be removed. Uh, there's going to be a notification for fish bites now. One exclamation mark for a light tug, three for a heavy tug, and I'd assume two if there's a medium tug. Uh, we saw that a little bit later in the ocean fishing section. Miscellaneous updates, you know, Allegan Tombstones, new Game Plus chapters, specifically the Alliance raid quests being added to New Game Plus. Um, that's going to be in 5.2. The free company rank is now going to go all the way up to 30. Jesus. And uh, the higher your rank, the more company chest space you'll have for free company rank. Um, umbrellas are going to be added. They show those a little bit later. Kind of weird, but, you know, that's, that's a thing. And new courses for Leap of Faith, which they also showed off a little bit later. They actually showed off most of the stuff in this patch. Um, so the Cinder Drift, they apparently accidentally showed things that their development team didn't want them to show during this. Now, I don't think they specifically said the thing they didn't want us to show, but considering they hid the UI when they did some of the later... Uh, things I'm assuming it was the text boxes that came up because during the Ruby weapon fight first of all it's a remix of the ultimate theme for phase one at least which sounds amazing second there were the text boxes that pop up for the encounter probably had some spoilerific details obviously it was in Japanese so I'd need it to be translated to really be spoiled but it was also in Final Fantasy 7 style chat boxes which was a, which was a nice little touch you know it's obviously coming from the source material they showed off a bit of the fight you know I'd assume that that fence which he says is safe right now will not always be safe Maybe it gets risen up in like a tower of sand or something like that. Um, the latter half of the battle says there's something special. They're not going to show it. I wonder if that's a new theme. I wonder if it's just like, you know, the transformation style for a boss fight. If he be, you know, like raises in size. Because he's big here, but he's not like massive. He's actually relatively close to the size Ruby Weapon is when you fight him in the actual battle versus the way he actually looks on maybe like the world map of Final Fantasy 7. So uh, also terrible, terrible angle for this because you can't see him at all. I might as well have just left it like this because that's honestly more than big enough. <clears throat> okay. So moving forward, uh, he attacked it for a little bit. Um, the most interesting mechanic we saw was probably this one. Uh, it, these, it basically, he does the thing where he sticks the claws in the ground from Final Fantasy VII, and it sends these uh, like raised ground areas, like the claws are moving through the ground, into AoE sections that explode and deal damage to anyone there. And then he does Whirl Sand, which sucks you gradually down, and if it you know brings you all the way under, then you die instantly. But you can stand on these little sections right here. Uh, they're like raised ground that you can stand on to get out of the world sand. I'm sure there's going to be some fun stuff with that in extreme. Potentially they follow players and maybe there's split damage AoEs. Maybe they can be destroyed in some way. But there's room for some pretty interesting stuff. It is just a normal and EX trial though, so don't expect anything too crazy fancy. Um, but then of course the Cinder Drift and the Sorrow of Warlet, that story will continue in future patches as well. Uh, job adjustments, this is everything I said earlier. Red Mage getting a buff, Summoner getting some dot nerfs. Um, for Red Mage, specifically Flesh is being buffed, and the drop-off for some spells will be removed. I believe Contre is the only one that has spell drop-off. Um, and then it was Samurai's Meditation Stacks, um, and then some PvP balance adjustments, with Summoner apparently being the base for balancing in PvP per in particular. Which, as someone who doesn't know a lot about PvP, I'd, I'd relegate that judgment to a PvP expert. Um, to take their opinion for it. We also saw the Katari. These are the new gathering exclusive Beast Tribe quest that you can take part in uh, with their little, new little section, some new mounts, some new story. Um, and Yoshifi said he actually really enjoyed the Katari. So hopefully we enjoy it as well. You need to be level 70 plus for these. So 70 to 80, you can use them to level your gatherers as if you were having a hard time leveling those all together. And again, it is gathering, not battle classes. So you do need to use a gatherer for this one. Um, and then uh, it'll talk a little bit about the history of Ractica. And there will be a branching path at some point where you can choose to go down one side of the story or go down the other, and you can't access the other path until presumably New Game Plus adds Beast Tribe quests. 
Um, however, the rewards and experience you receive will all be the same. Um, so think of it like, you know, the end of Eureka or even more recently, the uh, near Automata raid, the first one. There's a choice you have to make there that changes things slightly, but it still ultimately comes out to be approximately the same thing by the time it's all said and done. Uh, we got to see the uh, Scree mount. It's the pot of Screed. Uh, yeah, it is the uh, the Great Serpent of Ranka in a pot, essentially, that plays music notes as you go by in it. And yes, it does fly. All mounts fly now. And then a new course in the Leap of Faith. So it says new courses. I'm assuming it means that it's just this environment and it can be multiple different layouts of courses. And if you fall off, you have to go all the way back to the beginning. Yoshi P got like a third of the way and then fell off after going for a silver Cactar Medal. I love Leap of Faith. It's 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 just enough of the jump puzzle frustrations that you get from games that have that kind of stuff, but it's not super difficult. So I'm always down for these. Anytime I see them in the Gold Saucer, I love doing them. So I'm very much looking forward to this. And I loved watching Yoshi P screw up jumps over and over again during the live stream. All right, so then they took a little bit of a break. They showed a video from the Korean... Uh, fan fest that they held not too long ago over in Seoul and then there was just you know a little bit of a break so we'll just we'll go past the images you know there's not really much to say about any of them um, and then they went into showing Eden's verse now there is some stuff regarding this in the trailer and that's a discussion for another video so again this is where they started turning off the UI for everything so I'm assuming he would have said dialogue that was spoilerific in some way or there might have been something on the screen that was spoilerific they wouldn't tell us which encounter this is. My personal prediction is that the trailer order of encounters is the order for the first three encounters. So it's like the Krill from Gears of War, um, Ramu second, and then Ifrit Garuda third. They're, I'm sorry, yeah, Ifrit Garuda third, all part of one fight. And my personal prediction for the fourth fight, and the, everything's up in the air. I want it to be Shiva. I've said that for ages now, but there's nothing to indicate that that is a prediction and a hope, kind of. So, I also got this prediction right. Uh, Ramu is a centaur man. He is... I, somebody said it's like a Terator or something is the exact name. Because he's horse body with wings and like the top half of a man. So they, somebody gave me the term for it before. Um, but it's basically Ixion inspired lower half. Ramu inspired top half with less of an extravagant beard. And uh, the wings almost like Bismarck or Zervan wings kind of in a sense. Uh, but it looks great. And the music theme, you got to watch that live letter to get that music theme, man. That was, I, I can't wait to hear the Ifrit Garuda one because that's going to be a mishmash. I'm not a big fan of the Ifrit theme. I'm a huge fan of the Garuda theme. And I can't wait to hear the mishmash together. Oh, man. Uh, so there's panels on the platform. We actually got to see a decent bit of the encounter. We got to see the orbs that spawn. So we got to see a big uh, a big staff and a little staff. And the big staff exploded first, and it left all of these uh, all of these orbs all around the arena. And those orbs in the normal Ramu back in the Realm Reborn would, uh, and when you collected enough of them, give you a resistance to Ramu's tank buster. It just get, and give you resistance to some of his other attacks as well. And if you grab too many of them, then it started reducing the healing you received. Um, they also increased Ramu's power the more of them that were on the arena. So controlling them was vital. I have a feeling it's going to be very much the same here in this encounter, at least uh, to some degree. Uh, we also got to see placing thunderclouds that occasionally, you know, spark and do AoE damage. So if they're placed in a bad spot, they'll just destroy the party. Um... We got to see a tank buster, we got to see a room-wide AoE, and we got to see a spot where he did a room-wide AoE, and a ton more orbs appeared on top of the ones that were already there. So, it was, it was, it was crazy. The orb management was a big part of the original, so I assume orb management will be a big part of uh, this one as well. You kind of see the AoE ranges here, the orbs spawning. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it gets pretty, uh, pretty crazy. Pretty crazy there. It's filled with orbs. Orbs, 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 orbs. Orbs everywhere. Um, then they said this one will be a little more difficult than Eden's Gate. They said the same thing about Sigma Scape. It's a very minor difference. You know, it's more noticeable to people who aren't rating at the very top end. And for people at the top end, you know, we've kind of seen everything at this point. So that little bit doesn't it's if it's not ultimate level, it just it doesn't kind of ring as very much harder, uh, in my own personal opinion. 
Uh, let's see. They said there, we might see some new types of mechanics. They had a bunch of different people. Every fight was designed by a different developer, but they've all done Savage fights before, and they tried to do some new and exciting stuff. So I'm always down for that. Savage is a great place to explore some of these ideas and possibilities, and they can be expanded upon in future content. They can be experimented on and re reutilized in very unique ways later on. And so it's a good, it's a good thing that they're still trying as hard as it is to get things that are absolutely brand new on the table. Should feel fresh. That was their, their ultimate thing. So then we have ocean fishing. Uh, ocean fishing is almost Final Fantasy XI style fishing on a boat, but it has very much, it very much doesn't work that way. That's going to be the comparison most people draw, but it very much doesn't work that way once you're actually on the boat. For the fishing itself, there's an NPC over in, uh, I believe this is Limza? Is that Limza or is that in, uh, what's the, what's the name of the... The teleport yeah new npc at the docks in limza it says it right there that's limza uh every two hours you'll have the option to get on a boat each boat hosts up to 24 people and when 24 people are queued into a boat the boat will take off and another boat will line up so every two hours there's a 15 minute window for you to get on one of these boats so let's say the that two hour window is at 8 p.m pacific from 8 to 8 15 you can get on the boat and then it's closed until 10 p.m so it's a very limited window content that you'll have to really want to be a part of if you want to participate. Once you're on the boat, once the boat is full and set out, it, they said they, they give you a one hour instance, but they said realistically it should only take you like 20 to 30 minutes to do the entire um, expedition. So what the boat does is it shepherds you to three different places for you to fish. And everyone on the boat has to contribute to the overall haul that you'll take back, and that will help determine the rewards at the end, which includes scripts and experience points. Uh, you can use big fishing to level right from the get-go. You only need to be level one fisher in order to use this. So if you've never leveled fishing before, but this sounds interesting to you, this can be the way that you level fishing if you really want to. It can take you over to Costa del Sol, to Pharaoh Sirius, to... Um, the Dravanian Hinterlands over by where Idleshire is. The boat takes you to a few different places and they'll add more in later uh, in later patches. So every fishing spot, you have seven minutes, fish as much as you can. And if certain conditions are met by even a single person, then the haul, basically you get into this uh, current, I suppose it's called. I think the official name for the current's on here. Um, a spectral current. And that gives you a chance for a big haul, which will increase your rewards overall. Um... <clears throat> and at the end, it'll even tell you uh, how much each person contributed. So there's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like uh, FF logs for fishing, in a sense, over in uh, over for this content. But they plan again on adding more routes, adding more activities. Maybe like enemy pirate ships will come out and like challenge you to a fishing jamboree, I suppose. Um, but this is, they said this is very much the skeleton of the content. It's functional, it has rewards. And uh, you can group up with parties and do it. Hold competitions with your free company if you really want to. Um, it's built to do like all the most basic things. Um, but they plan on expanding it in the future. They're not done developing new features for it. Uh, so then going forward, just... The, oh, you can also buy bait or repair gear on the boat itself. So if you forgot those things, don't worry. You should still be good to go. Um, and then, of course, the weather, the time of day, uh, those things will affect the kinds of fish and the types of hauls that you can get. You can see the exclamation marks here for uh, the new fishing notifications, like when you actually get a bite. And then, uh, you know, all the other stuff is, uh, you know, here. It's very, you know, low-key competitive feature, whether it be amongst friends or strangers when it comes to fishing. Uh, it's actually quite interesting to me. I didn't think it was going to be that kind of fishing. I literally thought it was just going to be a boat go fish. And it is that at its core, but they've built some things around it that are quite interesting. I do wish the boat moved while you were fishing it moves between fishing spots but then it stays still for the seven minutes that you're actually fishing so that's a little disappointing but it's not the end of the world um overall i even might finish getting my fisher to 80 on this just because it's a nice little social feature in an, in an online game there's a lot of little things you can stop and enjoy in a piece of content like this slow down the pace of kind of gaming the way it is now and go back to a, a simpler era i'm not a fan of the boat in final fantasy 11 but this might be something I can absorb, even just in small doses, because it's a small dose amongst a, a constantly moving machine that is the rest of Final Fantasy XIV. So, with that, Fellowships, Level 1 Fisher, you, you can, you know, hang paintings of the fish that you've caught, fish prints for housing, show off new raid gear, paladin gear looks sick. 
if I gotta say so myself. Um, the Dragoon Gear, the Spear, I'm a fan. Uh, the Samurai stuff, eh, it looks okay. It's, I'm, I, I like the hilt on the the Samurai Katana, but I'm, I'm not like a super big fan of the Monk Sam gear. It's okay. The ranged DPS gear, dude, that crossbow. That's it. That's all I needed to see. That crossbow is... Oh, it, pff, instant winner. Instant, instant victory right there. This is kind of like reminiscent of the old Bard hat, and then some of this... Like, this is all very noticeably ranged DPS gear. Like, I've seen some variant of it before. That weapon, though. Oh, Oh my god, I needed that. And ninja looks okay too. I actually really like the uh, katanas, the uh, the ninja swords here. So uh, that's that's a plus. But otherwise, gear wise, I'm not too doesn't feel too inspired by anything. At least maybe not from that angle. Healer stuff looks okay. Looks like healer stuff. The globe looks pretty cool. And then the caster stuff looks like caster stuff. I don't really have much to say about that. Yeah, you know, that's just how I feel. Foxconn looks like he's very much not interested in this picture right here. He's falling asleep. It's been a long day. Uh, and then, uh, that's it. That's what they showed. Oh, some crafted gear. The ranged DPS winner, the contest winner, the designer, their stuff is being added as crafted gear. So here's a screenshot of it uh, with the render on characters. And there's going to be a whole bunch of other sets for crafted that's based on this design. But this is the actual, what it looks like on ranged physical DPS as crafted gear. So it looks good. I think the, I've really liked all the winners. I never look at who's won every time there's a contest. I find out in live letters. And that's that's really good. I like that design. Uh, and I'm curious to see what it'll look like for the other roles. Now back to Ishgard. They had to be very careful with showing us Ishgard stuff because they already had 5.3 stuff on the machine that they were testing it on. So they're throwing a bunch of commands. They went to the uh, Diadem. They had a bug. They couldn't actually gather anything in the Diadem because of that bug. But we got to see the beam cannon rocket launcher limit break for gatherers in action. So basically you fly around. You gather materials that are used in Ishgard's restoration to craft certain items for Ishgard's restoration. And then you can also, as you do that, you generate... Uh, ether and you can expend that ether with what literally is a laser cannon that one shots enemies and depending on the enemy you destroy you get rare materials back from them and then those are used for the harder recipes probably stuff like the expert recipes later on um we got to see a little bit of that here he literally blasts the thing for like two million damage you can see him it's a little blurry but he's charging up his laser right here it was really cool and you can store up to five pieces of ammo for that at once and the enemies respawn pretty quick so you don't have to worry too much about competition when it comes to this skill i'm curious though if too, too many people try to use it on one enemy and like one instance of the diadem if it's going to like expend it but you won't get any items it's a concern i have we'll see if that's how it pans out when it actually comes out you can also cloud fish here you can do all three of the gatherers, mining, uh, botany, and do cloud fishing here. And then, uh, yeah, you'll use this as part of the Ishgard Restoration. There's also a new mount that you can obtain from Ishgard Restoration, the uh, Dalmel. There's also different weather conditions that can spawn rarer enemies. So if you have rare weather conditions, there might be certain materials you can only obtain like that. Um, and yeah, that's uh, it's looking pretty good. And then, of course, Ishgard. There will be a lot more in the way of the Fate events this time around. They are disabling the cross-server stuff off the get-go, I believe they said. Uh, I think they make mention of that a little bit later on. They make sure it wasn't earlier on. So I can... Uh... Yeah, there will be more steps during the restorations. So there will be more opportunities to take part in a fate. Well, it just is talking about design mistakes with people from other worlds. So considering they call it a mistake, I'm assuming it, it'll it continue to be like it has to be your world in order to participate in Ishgard. I don't think there's much concern about servers not finishing Ishgard. Just some are just going to do it slower than others. Um, they also showed us the Kupo of Fortune. It's a scratch card that has five rewards per scratch card. The first place reward looks like it's Pisces with all the different crafting maybe gathering AF1s because the first one was a Pisa in a chef's hat the second one was a Pisa in like I think it was the weaver top hat um and they just it's the only two Kupo of fortunes they showed us but two is you know a decent sample size to maybe guess that it's a ton of different Pisa minions with the different crafting and gathering AF1s. Maybe not gathering, but at the very least crafting. Um, the other rewards are somewhat random a little bit. There's like music sheets, there's old minions. We saw like the Bun Bun from, uh, I think that's from the Stormblood maps, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we saw a, one of the new emotes that's available, Eat Bread. We see some furnishings, we see some materia, we see some fireworks. Um, there's 
And there's also two different categories of scratches you can do on one Koopa. You can only pick one place to scratch no matter what, one of the four. The one on the left, you can't get first or last place, but you have a decent odds of getting two, three, or four. The ones on the right, you can get any reward, but you have a very high odds of getting the uh, the fifth place reward and low odds. I think it was 8% odds of getting the first place prize. Yoshi P got a fifth place prize and a fourth place prize when he did it. So he got the fireworks and he got the eat bread emote, which looks better than the actual eating emote. At least it's not just the eating emote again, but looks good. They just pull out stale bread and chomp on it a little bit. Different animations for all the different races. And uh, yeah. We have a new, what looks like a barista glam. Looks like it's uh, Choco Bucks because there's a little Chocobo on the front of the apron. There's, these are going to be all new rewards from Ishgard Restoration. Again, three weeks after 5.2 and 5.21 uh, is when all this stuff will be hitting. Sky Steel tools are crafter and gatherer relics where it's very simple. It's not script related, it appears. It's literally, they'll give you a list of things you need to gather or craft and you do that and you'll gradually power up the weapon. It won't be as strong as the fully pentamelded stuff that you can do now yet. It's probably similar to the relics where the relics always lag behind the raid stuff until the very end of the expansion and then it's equal to or surpasses it usually by one of the later points. And it's going to be the same for these. So if you don't want to do the pentamelded weapons or you just want something else to work on, then these crafting and gathering sky steel tools will be the way to go for you. Um, and there is some story behind them. There's blueprints of historical legendary tools of legend. And they're going to help with the restoration of Ishgard. And they showed some of the designs. Uh, there's like a dragon on the frying pan. You got Thor's hammer here, the pickaxe, the saw with kind of like the little dragon's tail here. They look pretty cool. They don't glow right off the bat, but they will glow eventually so keep in mind that as you upgrade them the appearance will also continue to upgrade as well so it's like normal relics do then we come to the normal relics and i've never said this before but i'm excited <laughs> all right so sorry for the jump cut i was recording this live on twitch and my internet went out one of the downfalls of that so i'm gonna i'm live on twitch again for the second part of this recording i'll edit them together and it'll be fine for uh, a video on YouTube for Sunny Vegas. So sorry for those of you watching on Twitch, and sorry for those on YouTube for the random jump cut. And I'm just going to decide to pick off, uh, pick up where I left off with the relics. I had started describing it, and I'll just start over on that section. So we had finished talking about the Sky Steel tools and how those are basically crafter and gather relics, and now we get to talk about our actual combat relics, which have always been kind of a contentious topic. You know, people talk about the Realm Reborn relics, the original Zodiac quest series, the Anima quest series, the Eureka quest series, and this looks like it's trying to find only the things people liked about the various ones and combine it into one quest. A risky endeavor, but let's explain. So first of all, the name of the quest series, as we discussed earlier in the video, is Save the Queen Blades of Gunhilder, and we're going to be working to um, free the Hrothgars from their uh, Garlean oppressors in the Bajja area of Ilsabard. So for this first series, it's a quest series of up for upgradable equipment. And through these quests, you'll obtain the base weapon. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? The A Realm Reborn series worked exactly that way with the initial one. And a lot of people look back on having kind of fond memories of that, of going through very specific instances and dungeons and quests and some open world objectives. A little bit of a mix of everything, but a very reasonably paced, uh, you know, quest. You could, you could do multiples of those as long as you could clear some of the instances that had to go in there, like Titan Hard Mode. And it looks like they're going to be returning to that form here. Um, and we'll expand upon that a little bit later. Um, specifically for the story, we're looking to free Basha from the Legatus Noah Van Gabranth of the 4th Legion. Some of you may remember him from the Return to Evil East quest series. And what do you know? You have to complete the Return to Evil East quest series in order to do this relic quest. That's going to get people to go back into those 24 mans, unlock them, and should be overall good for the raid roulette because getting this unlocked i a lot of people like to blame item level cheesing i'm gonna be honest a lot of people just straight up don't have it unlocked it's, it's not as big a thing with the item level cheesing as people think it is so getting people to have to do it for this will increase the number of people who have it and as long as everyone who's queuing in into that particular instance is level 70 or higher then they should be okay to actually get this this should be overall really good for the game before even considering the actual relic quest itself 
So with that, also that means there's some we can guess where this story is going, and it makes some of the trailer events make a lot more sense, which I'm looking forward to when I watch the English one. Also, Matsuno is in charge of the story for the Relic Quest series. He is back as another guest in the Final Fantasy XIV development team to do the story for our Relic Quest series. I am a big fan of that, because I was a big fan of the Return to Evil East Quest series. Um, it's, I, I'm just glad. Glad to have him back. I was just I approve. That's, that's all I need to say. Uh, so for the first quest, like I said, it's going to be very simple. 5.25 for the quest will focus on story, getting you the base weapon. And that trial we mentioned earlier, the one that's like around extreme difficulty, even though it won't be called extreme, that'll be part of the quest series. I'd assume like the final part of it, uh, if any way, to judge it. And then... In 5.35, things are going to expand a lot more. This is going to be more like the Zodiac and Anima and Eureka weapons, kind of a combination of all of them. There will be another field instance in 5.35. Um, so they reference back to Eureka. In Eureka, both the story and the upgrade of the weapons were connected. To do one, you had to do the other. This time, it's more split. You don't have to progress one in order to progress the other but they are part of the story that is taking place here. Um, they say that it's really not another Eureka. Don't think of it like another Eureka. It will be quite a bit different. There are some aspects that are still going to be used. For example, there will be separate levels in that field instance, similar to the way we had elemental levels in Eureka, but that's not until 5.35, so we didn't need to worry about that for a while. Um, there is going to be another Baldessian Arsenal equivalent at some point. The development team is already internally calling it codename BA2 for Baldessian Arsenal 2. But they want to capture the things people like the most about it and take away the parts of people that made people frustrated. Again, they're just trying to find the most liked parts about the different relic quests that have exist existed up to this point and use only those, which is a good thing. There have been points of the Relic that work great. Having a deep and uh, a deep story behind it, like the Zodiac quest line, great. They've got this with this, uh, this way that we're going to be helping the Hrothgar free their home nation, which is also a great tie into the Gunbreaker quest series that we had um, in Shadowbringers. We have a Realm Reborn style questing for the base weapon, where there's a good bit of challenge behind it. It's very linear. Uh, people will all be working on the same objective, so finding people working on the objective for the same group should work quite well. Uh, I do have some questions about that EX trial, though, because if it's only for this and there's not other rewards from it, there's the question of, you know, later down the line, do they need to re-incentivize it in some way, like they do with some of the Hildebrand stuff? Well, we'll see about that one, because that's a big question mark, I personally feel like, since it's its own separate fight from anything else. And then, of course, the field instances, we need to know, like, they said that the field instances this time in the last live letter were going to be a little bit more friendly to your time, meaning that you should be able to get in there and get something done without too much concern, uh, which makes it sound a little bit more solo friendly, not as reliant on this whole train or chain mentality that people had. But So maybe a few extra activities. Um, hopefully, it just it's complete and it feels complete by the time we get it in 5.35. That's probably why they're not doing a field area until 5.35, so they don't have a situation where half the features are missing like they were with Animos and Pagos, and then we just had to wait until the latter half in order to see more things actually evolve from it. I want to see what lessons they learn from Eureka about this in particular, and how they want to separate the weapon and the progression inside the exploration zone, but at the same time tie them together to the same story. It's a very, very interesting uh, thing that they're saying they're doing here, we have to see them do it. And then they showed off umbrellas. That's it. It's just umbrellas are kind of like mounts, but they're not mounts. They're just umbrellas. <laughs> they don't. They, they make it so your character doesn't get wet in the rain. It's it's another glam option. It's kind of coded like a mount is, but it can be used in towns. Uh, there's going to be umbrellas that drop from different content. It's going to eventually get its own umbrella menu. It's it's a lot of work for umbrellas. Is all I can say. But they said they promised it three years ago, and they're going to deliver on it. Man, Eggy Glamours was way longer than three years ago, <laughs> as far as I remember. Uh, so then they just described, like, you know, what actually went into designing it, you know, where there will be stuff. They showed the spear of bonding and the, the not losing the item when retaining the materia. They said Demi Materia will have its price adjusted. Sell them now if you have any Demi Materia that's just lying around. And then they gave us the information I have been waiting for, FanFest info. North America will be in San Diego, which I predicted Anaheim incorrectly. 
I thought secondary maybe LA, but when people said San Diego, I was like, I would love to go to San Diego. I hope it's in San Diego. It's in San Diego. I love the time I lived in San Diego. I love visiting San Diego. And there's a comma missing at November 7th. So I'll see you in the year 72,020 because that's when the second day of San Diego, of the, of the Fan Fest in San Diego is going to be taking place. I'm excited. Uh, November 6th, November 7th. They said that this convention center has two times the capacity of what they did last time. Obviously, I think it has more than that, but that's how much they'll probably realistically be renting out. If I'm not mistaken, the last Vegas Fan Fest had an 8,000 capacity. I think a 16,000 capacity should be, uh, you know, 15,000-ish capacity is probably a safe bet to say. Should be more than enough, and that means it should be quite the grand the quite the grand event so uh, i'm really really looking forward to that the japan one will be december 19th and 20th in nagoya japan they had to move it from tokyo because of the uh olympics they just all events for like tokyo for the year like being moved out constantly and then london will be where the european fan festival takes place february 20th not as long as a gap between these ones uh the, the first gap is very similar from november to december the second one feels like it's a little bit shorter i think we had to wait all the way till march till the japanese fan fest last time and some will be towards the latter half you know about a little bit over a year from now and that all of this, of course, is for expansion announcements, updates, new jobs. That's what they do FanFest for. They don't just hold them for no reason. So we can already start getting a little bit excited and start making our predictions for 6.0. So with that, they also had a few other announcements. Uh, they just had, uh, you know, they'll do a patch note reading on the 18th before the patch goes live. PAX East is coming up. There will be a Ruby Weapon Battle Challenge there. And there will also be joined by concept artist Yusuke Mogi, who will be there with Yoshi P as well to do a panel. And there's going to be a fan gathering for attendees as well. There's also going to the Art of Reflection Histories Forsaken book, which is uh, releasing on May 2020. I believe it is already pre-orderable, if I'm not mistaken. And that comes up, that comes with a wind-up Dulia Chai minion who is carrying her poor husband who just doesn't want to be choked to death but he has no choice in the matter nowadays there's also the uh the nhk nhk zen final fantasy die toyo I, I'm, I'm trying not to zoom in on it so i'm hoping i'm saying that right and that's just the vote on your favorite aspects of final fantasy games that's something we won't participate in that's going to be japan no doubt uh, there's also going to be a Japanese hotel collaboration uh, as well over at the Royal Park Hotel Iconic Tokyo Shiodome. And that's going to be from Wednesday, March 18th to June 30th. It'll just be Final Fantasy 14 themed uh, hotel rooms, specifically Ilmeg. Those are the rooms that are specifically designed on Ilmeg. Uh, mugs of special designs will be available and specialty drinks at the bar lounge. There, see, he's got one. He's got one of the mugs. One of the cups that people staying will get. And then the Primals are going to be doing a little tour. Just a, like a two-day concert in Japan on April 14th and 15th. You know, I'm not going, obviously. <laughs> I wish I would. I wish I could. But that's way too close to 7 Remake. And uh, also, uh, you know, across an ocean. So probably not going to that. And uh, that was the live letter. It was pretty juicy. You know, looking back, they actually did go into a lot more detail on some things than I thought they would. And I got exactly a lot of the answers that I wanted about certain content that came out of this. I got promises of a new Baldessian Arsenal. I got promises of an A Realm Reborn style relic. I got promises of a new exploration zone that's a little bit more thoroughly designed than the previous ones. Ocean fishing, the, the Ishgard changes, restoration, diadem, the new tools, some of the new glams, the raid gear, some new emotes. Like there's there's actually, it's pretty mean. I can't remember the last time I was this at least satisfied with the overall volume of a, of a part two live letter. And I think it's because they didn't bring in a special guest most of the time when we go to the second half, it's the special guest Q&A and then announcements. I think because they didn't do that, it, it does feel that way, like much, much meatier than your average live letter. And I, you know what, I approve. It was a good way after such a lull of Final Fantasy XIV information, this is what I needed right now to get me excited for the next patch. So with that, I gotta edit these two parts together because my internet went out during that first part. And uh, thanks again for the unofficial translations from the uh, Final Fantasy XIV Discord, uh, Reddit Discord. Again, Iluna, uh, Shinitan, and uh, Miyuna were the three that I think were doing the translation. Says it right there. Um, thank you so much for all your hard work, guys. It's it's tough work. You wake up super early to do it, and uh, we appreciate it from the community. I at least speak for myself when I say that. We definitely appreciate it big time. So thanks everyone for watching this live letter overview and thoughts. Twitch, I'm going to keep streaming for a little bit. We still have some more stuff to take care of, but on the YouTube side of things, be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share, and stay tuned for 5.2 content.
Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next one. And until then, take care.